All right, so now we're all prepared. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Let's move on to our next segment. In this segment, watch our investors discuss the U.S. and global healthcare industry outlook and the future of healthcare trends. I would now like to call all the investors on stage to share their thoughts on this topic. Please welcome our panel of investors, David Imada. Woohoo! We just saw him. He was our Vanna White. <laughs> Matt Oguz, come on up, Matt. Round of applause for him. Dr. Ruchi Dana, all right. And Brendan Rogers, come on up, guys and gals. Okay, guys, and now I will be announcing, please help me in welcoming Daniel Piku, president and co-founder of Visayo. Okay, guys, and we are still waiting on Dr. Ruchi Dana and Kim Schofield. If you guys, uh, any of your friends with them, please text them, call them. Oh, here comes one, very good. <laughs> oh, wonderful. wonderful, everybody's here. Welcome everybody, how are you? How was the break? Good? Excellent, thank you, thank you. Appreciate your enthusiasm, sir. It's gonna be a good, it's going to be a great panel, guys. We're going to uh, discuss the future, and, and uh, there's going to be a lot of different topics. There's a very diverse group of people up here from all different educational backgrounds. Some people entrepreneurial. I was talking to this gentleman a few minutes ago. He's a physical therapist, three years. Didn't have any business experience, but he threw himself into it. So there's going to be a lot of different backgrounds up here. We're going to start with David. And um, can you guys can you hear okay? Does anybody know this guy? <laughs> Sir, we, we got a panel going, thank you. So, I'm sorry about him, David, but David Amada. David, stand up and, and welcome yourself. Give David a big hand for being on the panel. So David's a uh, business development specialist, and uh, he's going to share with us for a few minutes a little bit about the future of telehealth and about cyber security. Go ahead, David. Sorry, so these are kind of broad topics, and I'm going to kind of go on a high level, but the reason why I'm going to discuss that because my company has already funded a couple of startups, so I have in-depth um, knowledge. So I'll start with telehealth. Telehealth has been a big buzzword for many, many, many years, and it's supposedly trending higher, but I haven't seen it really become enterprise widespread. There's little niches here, and some startups are doing it, but uh, from my perspective, telehealth is good for lowering costs, but it's not being implemented. It's good for expanding the service and quality of healthcare. And for specialty um, medical s services like mental health therapy, which is I'm um, very passionate about. So I'll give you a quick example about that. So from California, um, San Francisco had a lot of mental health therapists. And about a few years ago, with the rents coming high and the big tech companies coming in, they, they lost their, their space. And of course, their services are high. Uh, with uh, good secure telehealth for counseling, you could have retired, some retired people in different parts of the, the, the state, or even full time in a lower economic rent area like Fresno or Chico, Eureka, um, and people could actually avail some of the services. Right now, they're getting squeezed because Medicare is not paying what these doctors want, so a lot of uh, patients can't get access to them. I'm one of them. I want to get counseling and. Everyone I called said we're not taking any patients. So this is a good way for that to happen. It's a matter of getting uh, the physicians themselves and the psychiatrists and psychologists and MSW people to accept it, but I haven't seen it widespread. Uh, cybersecurity, I'll go really quickly. We have a cybersecurity interest because not only for data, people saw like Quest Lab got hacked a couple weeks ago. They didn't know about for one year, right? And the reason why a lot of these uh, things are happening because 
from our perspective, companies large as small are still using good software antivirus, but a lot of firewalls. And once you breach the firewall, like in the elections, the data's raw data pulled out, right? So they have to embrace a two-fold prong, which we believe it is encrypted data, and it's more work for the employees and the companies, but also rely on your best firewalls. That's not only for data, but also for people thinking about science fiction, uh, implants in your body, right? They, they send out, like harmonics, they send out signals. Uh, some companies had to change the coding because the, the data could be you or somebody else. The worst case scenario, they can get into whatever medical device you have in your body or the robotic surgery or anything else that your doctor sabotage it and give you false readings or worse, some things are happening like that. So that's my interest in. I, I think the future is bright. We just have to get the, uh, cap, the venture capitalists and the larger medical firms in, interested in spreading this out because rural, the rural community is really underserved. They really need this type of quality video secure telehealth. And I'll pass it on to my partner. For Thank you, David. We're going to have a uh, question and answer for a few minutes at the end of the panel, by the way. So if you have any questions, write them down. I'm going to ask David a question before we move on to Ruchi here. What, what is the biggest thing holding back telehealth? It's such a great concept and idea. What's the biggest thing holding it back? I think they're afraid of the change. Uh, we've offered, with our startup, free software to these mental health therapists turn this down code, right? That's, I think they're afraid of changing the model and not Is having the, zone? Uh, I think revenue. Because if they adapt this, they can have no excuse not to not lower their costs. Because again, if you work from home, you don't have to have the, like working virtually, you don't have to have the, the overhead. Uh, you know, the employees. Uh, you can also hire people, again, not here, but if the entire state at a lower rate, right? Because again, if I'm living, like I said, in Chico, Eureka, or Fresno State, uh, Fresno, not, sorry, Fresno, some other place, Salinas. The people working there, they're, they're totally qualified and, and certified and got, you know, MDs and they have PhDs, MSWs. They're not going to expect the six-figure, you know, payments and the large premium, um, not pre large pay co-pays, and they can accept more Medicare patients. And actually, they can be more accommodating because they can work nights, weekends, holidays, and they can actually expand by not having employees, but having a, a loose knit of contractors, which is not a bad word in this case, right? And they can actually accommodate more people. And I've seen it because a lot of the um, people who are on uh, social services, they don't drive because they're not physically or mentally able to drive, they bust them in, and they miss a lot of appointments. But they're, even, even with their condition, they're used to video chats, right? Texting messages. The other thing uh, for the VA, right? But before they went to their, their health system, the veterans with PS PTSD had to be flown in to the different hospitals. So the good thing about this, now with, with their adaptive their technology, the veterans can see them all the time to fly, and it was a big expense, and people were not getting the, the care they needed, and of course, that led to higher more, you know, suicide rate, which we don't want. So I think it's, it's uh, in that sense, it's just reluctant to change the revenue model, change word about uh, you know, being a big firm, and also just uh, security, but security has evolved so much that I think that's just a minor issue right now. Excellent. Thank you, David. Give David a big hand. Thank you for sharing with everybody. Up next, we have Ruchi. And uh, Ruchi's involved. She went to Stanford University, and she's the COO of a startup that's working on uh, robotic surgery. And uh, we all know the future. Part of the future of healthcare is robots. And so Ruchi's going to share with you guys for a few minutes what she's involved in, what she's passionate about, and what the future looks like with robotic surgery. Thanks, David. So um, I studied medicine in India, and then I did my MBA from Stanford. So there's a course at Stanford. It's called Stanford Biodesign Program, in which like, we have like MBAs, engineers, PhD students, and doctors. They come together to solve like unmet needs in the market. So if you talk about robotic surgery, it's been there for the last 30 years. Intuitive Surgical is like the leading uh, provider of robotic surgery, uh, surgery devices. It's called the Da Vinci robot. And it's been the leader in the market for a long, long time. But the question now that comes is that why doesn't these robots reach to like, places like India, Asia, Africa? It's because the cost of robotic surgery is so high. And eventually, whenever a new technology comes in the market, what happens is like the cost would come down and the 
the device would become smaller. Like so what happened in the semiconductor industry or the solar panel industry, it's all about the question of cost later on. Once the new technology comes, it's, it's a higher price, but eventually the price would come down. So that's what we are working on right now. We want to bring these robots to like Asia, Africa, Middle East, because that's our target market. And that's, there's a huge unmet need in the, in the population there because like there are a lot of revision surgeries that happen in India, like you get a knee replacement and then after a couple of years you have to get it done again because there's not much precision involved with the doctors doing the surgeries on their own. With the help of robots, like there's high level of precision. It's like a CNC machine that's uh, doing the carpentry instead of a carpenter doing it manually. The good thing about robotic surgery is it's, it's not just like automatic. The, the surgeon would be there in the room and he would be holding the device in his hand. He has full authority and full control about the robots. That's something that people are afraid about. And, and as David mentioned, like people are very afraid to go into a new device that they're refusing to change, they're refusing to adapt. And that's the struggle that we are facing as well. Like the, the senior doctors, like in their mid 60s or so, they, they don't want to get into robotic surgery. Other thing that we are working on is augmented reality. So normally when a, when a surgeon works on a patient and he's operating, he usually has a screen up there. So he's operating here and he has to look at the screen up there and, and that causes a lot of errors because you, get, you just lose your focus and by the time you come back and your instrument is somewhere else and then you have to think again and maybe the nurse just uh, made a comment or something. So that causes a lot of errors and it increases the time of surgery as well. So we'll be bringing augmented reality in the, into the picture so there'll be like, uh, there'll be an overlay of the screen itself on the body of the patient. So, so the doctor would be easily aware about like what's, what's happening, what's the ECG like, everything. And, and then there, there's more about uh, like, uh, there's AI as well. Like you can see like which is the vein. The, the computer would actually show you, okay, this is the inferior vena cover and all. It would highlight it for you. So junior doctors can be able to do surgeries with much more confidence and they could actually bring about a huge change in the market. Excellent. Thank you uh, for sharing. I've got a question that comes to mind yeah. after listening to you. What is, uh, besides doctors and the adaptation of them accepting yeah. robotic surgery because of their age or the learning curve of it, what are the couple biggest challenges you're facing as a startup? Sure. One of the biggest challenges that we are facing right now, because it, it involves like AI and robotics, we need a lot of data. And like even the hospital groups, like even if you go to the most innovative hospital groups, they're afraid to share the data. I don't know what they want to do with the data. It's, it's their own personal data, but they don't want to share it with the startup. And that's the initial challenge that we're facing. And the more and more data that we'll be able to get, like the CT scans, MRI scans and all, the better our robots would become. So that's the challenge that every startup faces in this field, to gather the data. So, th so the way that we are going about is we are forming JVs with them so that like, both of them would like, even our startup and they would win. We'd have like a research prototype there in their place and they could like market it and we, in turn we'd get the data. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Give Ruchi a big hand. Thank you. Thank you, Ruchi, for sharing with everybody. Thanks, Steve. Next up, we're gonna have Brendan Rogers and uh, Brendan, ha Brendan has created a app for, it's like the Uber of dog walking called Wag Labs, and he's raised a significant amount of capital. He's going to share with us for a few minutes the challenges of his startup, where he's at, what the future looks like with his app over the next few years. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, Wag, I don't know if anyone's heard of the company Wag. We're a mobile dog walking app uh, for your mobile device, and we want to essentially send a, a dog walker to your home in under 30 minutes, and you have full transparency. Uh, on your phone where the dog is being walked, where the dog is going to the bathroom. Um, and when the walk is done, you get a report card on how the walk went and all the financial transactions done through the app. So it's a very frictionless process of, uh, you know, having your pet walked when you're, you know, busy at work or you're in traffic or you want to stay out later with your friends. Um, one thing that we really, really wanted to do and really get inside the pet parent's home was dog walking because it has such a high uh, recurrence rate and the fr uh, retention rate is super, super high. So we essentially have hired uh, contract dog walkers all over the United States in over um, 40, 43 states and um, we essentially will bring the, the walker to their home. Um, the, the vision and the overall um, roadmap for the business is we want to capture the whole life cycle of owning a pet. So like I said, 
getting into the pet parent's home, you need to you know, provide trust and you need to provide a really safe product. What we feel with dog walking is that we can provide this service on a daily basis and provide a really trust and, and safe product to the pet parent where eventually when we launch uh, sitting and boarding and dog daycare and eventually maybe have your pet medical records within our app, um, pet insurance, that these new services, the adoption rate is, you know, a lot higher and we've, you know, surveyed our customers and they definitely want these new services because they trust us because they use us as a, as a dog walker. Um, we want to be the button on your phone for your pet and um, these other services and owning the whole life cycle of a pet is, uh, is, is you know, can really extend lifetime value and, um, you know, people have dogs their whole life. People will have multiple dogs through, you know, throughout their lifetime. So we feel that we can be the button on your phone for your pet. Um, so yeah, uh, recently raised a round of capital from SoftBank's Vision Fund. Um, they have a slew of companies in their portfolio that is in the gig economy space. And we're super excited to be partnered with them and, and really scale WAG um, on a global stage. So. Excellent question that comes to mind. What gave you the idea for a dog walking app? Why this particular business? Yeah, so the other co-founders uh, and I, we moved out to Los Angeles uh, from the East Coast in 2011, and we lived next to uh, a hiking trail called Runyon Canyon, which is right in the heart of Hollywood. And we would essentially go and run and hike and just kind of be in Runyon Canyon, but we noticed everybody had dogs. And like, the amount of dog walkers there were was, it was an, an exceptional amount of, of dog walkers. And um, it seemed like people weren't even like getting married or having children. It was like the new boyfriend or girlfriend was your pet. Um, so we saw that there was a huge entry into the market because it was just mom and pops, Petco, PetSmart. None of these big, you know, brick and mortar companies were executing on this, you know, pet service through your mobile phone. So we thought there was entry into the market, so we launched right in Running Canyon. Um, you know, it's a great job for contractors because in LA, people, you know, are really, you know, it's heavily dominated by the entertainment space, so people want to, um, you know, have flexibility in their, in their job. So walking dogs, getting a tan, you know, getting exercise is, is someone's, like, you know, dream side hustle. So it was a good place to acquire our supply of the walkers, and we created this essentially this community and small cult in Los Angeles of the Uber for dog walking. And it really took off. And, um, you know, we, my, my other co-founder had a dog and, uh, every time we'd want to like, you know, go to the, the gym or something, the dog would like, uh, we'd have to take the dog out and this whole like fiasco. And we're just like, if only if we had a service where we could provide, um, you know, a, a service where we can have a, a dog walker come to, to your house to, to take care of all that. So that's kind of how it started and just getting started and we're super excited to, to really be the, the number one pet company in the world. Excellent. With the gig economy, it sounds like the perfect fit for contractors and people need to earn extra money. Give Brendan a big hand. <laughs> up, up next from my home state of Utah, my adopted home state, we've got Spencer Lowe. He's a CEO and founder of Integrated Clinical Research. Got a background in physical therapy, and like I mentioned before, he jumped into the business world with his feet. He's had a heck of an education the last few years, building an incredible company. He's going to share with you a little bit about what they do. Yeah, I too like to claim that I'm adopted into Utah. My wife is from there, so I'm stuck. Um, I'm from Florida. I went to high school there. I like to claim Florida because the other places were Idaho and Wyoming, and it just sounds more exotic than those places, so I say I'm from Florida. But... Um, over the last several years, we've, um, my, my background is clinical. Um, I uh, am a physical therapist by trade, um, done a lot of different things. Um, I speak five languages, been around a little bit, um, but I've done, done a lot of work internationally. Um, our company focuses on interventions for physical therapy and rehab um, based mostly in, in patients' homes. So we contract with home health agencies, do um, our own home visits. We have physicians that also work with us um, and do uh, visits with us. Um, but we are flexible in how we treat patients. Um, by a show of hands, who's, who's done physical therapy before? Anybody? Did it hurt? Keep your hand up if it hurt. Okay, it shouldn't have. So this is what our philosophy is based around. 
People go to physical therapy, and they're given a list of exercises. Why? We can send you to a personal trainer if we want you to do exercises. So as physical therapists, our focus is on something other than exercise. We focus a lot on manual therapy techniques. We steal ideas from the Chinese. Chinese do a lot of great manual techniques. They, uh, things similar to acupuncture and uh, their gua sha technique is what we focus on. Mobilizations, getting people to feel better because if you can feel better, you'll move better. Um, if you go to therapy and all you do is hurt more, well, that's the wrong direction. Because I've never worked with anybody as a physical therapist that didn't already have pain. So if I make your pain worse, we're good as physical therapy. Um, our focus has shifted towards chronic pain management. Uh, we staff a lot of pain clinics. And people in pain clinics have done physical therapy before, and they don't want to do it again because it hurt. And I don't, frankly, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to go back either if I were them. Uh, so our focus has been working with the chronic pain population and 65 and older, primarily Medicare, um, in how we treat and improve quality of life. Um, we, we specialize as well, uh, not just in pain management and spinal care, uh, but in total knee replacements. Um, our group in the seven states that we're in, mostly the western states, uh, we treat about 5,000 knee replacement patients per year. Uh, we see a lot of it. The techniques that we do have changed, and they will continue to change as technology changes, as we um, incorporate things like telehealth and surgeons that are using robots to perform orthopedic surgeries. It's always changing. Um, our philosophy is that uh, we like to follow a protocol. Um, the protocol is there's no protocol. Because protocols are good because they're the same for everybody, right? Everyone gets the same thing. But protocols are bad because they're the same for everybody. Not everyone responds the same. So we stick to a guideline only in so much as the patient needs it. But we go outside of our comfort zone to provide the best possible care. That has become contagious over the multiple states that we're in, and patients notice a difference. Uh, we have worked with lots of um, executives and owners of companies, and you know what? We ask people why we should choose them. They say, well, we care more. Everybody cares more. What are you actually doing that's different that people would want to come to you? And that's what we focus on, and our patients keep coming back time and time again. It's nice for job security, but it also with uh, current healthcare trends and reimbursement, it improves patient outcomes, allows patients to become more compliant, improves their outcomes, and ultimately our reimbursement model improves a little bit. So that's what we do. Uh, we're always looking to improve on how we're treating patients and incorporate new technologies and interventions with our patients. Excellent, thanks for sharing with us. Question that comes to mind, you've been in business three years, 5,000 patients a year in seven states. What are the next three years? Looks for, what's your vision for the company over the next three years? Yeah, we're, we've expanded to seven states in three years. I wanna be in the rest of the 43 by the next three. And how many, how many patients do you wanna serve annually? What's, oh. your, goal, what's your goal? Uh, we wanna be you know, about 15,000 patients annually within our 50 states. Excellent. Please uh, give a big hand for Spencer. Great job. Excellent job. Up next, we have Kim Schofield. And Kim is the CEO and founder of Space 42 and Bad Wolf Consulting. And uh, she's going to share with you, she's from Canada, and she's going to share with you her perspective as an investor and somebody in the VC world that's raised a lot of capital. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So, sorry, my voice is a bit raspy today, but we'll be good. Uh, so I'm kind of on the other side of the table from um, you people. I've been there, so now on the other side, I can hopefully provide a service that is really, really useful and really, really relevant. Uh, what I did is I took my two backgrounds, so I'm an AI consultant, and uh, basically I write AI programming and I do the math that makes your computer run faster, better, or I, I write um, smart tutoring programs, things like that. Um, I've written securities in the past, I've written all kinds of good things, and what I decided was that I could take that knowledge as an AI consultant, uh, I'm a cognitive linguist, which means I take what computers do, and then I bridge that to the human. So what you think the computer is asking you, it's actually asking you, and what you tell the computer, it understands. So it kind of brings those two worlds together. And so what I did, um, when I moved into the private investment world, 
uh, with a partner of mine. I uh, took that and created, um, from Bad Wolf Consulting, we still have that, but we created Space 42. So in Space 42, I focused on three things. One is investment funds, because I truly believe to get everybody's companies off the ground in today's climate, you need investment funds. You need a pool of people and a pool of thought and talent coming together. And that puts a pool of mentors behind every investment as well. So we did that, and I do investor education, because I also truly believe that as the world progresses, everybody wants to be an investor, and there's something we call smart money, which means you can sink a company as easily as you can help a company if you don't do it properly. So we have high-level investor education, investment funds, and an investor platform. So I um, wrote up, customized a platform that comes out of Estonia, and what we do is we take all of our companies, we put them on this platform, and the platform asks you questions, you have a profile, and it makes you investor ready, which means you're now not wasting your time with multiple investor meetings, and my investors, it's a private network, so these are my investors. When they come and we set them up to look at your profile, you're not wasting their time either, because all of your information is there. We set up conference calls, talk to people, um, we have investment funds that you would qualify for, and we can kind of move you through that process. So that's basically uh, what we're doing. We're trying to get the world, or get the, the private investment world into some kind of order and protocol, because everybody's doing their own thing. And I used to say, literally, you could not have a conference call with a group of private investors, because nobody could even agree on a platform, from Google to appear to, um, whatever else, Zoom, whatever you want to use. So we need a platform where everyone's asking the same questions, we're looking at the same answers, we know all of the protocols are covered, all of the legals are covered, everything we need to know. And the most important part is that this platform I created has my deal room and then has a set, has deal rooms underneath it. So we have investment funds and investment groups all with deal rooms underneath it with customized questions, but we can then aggregate that data. We can now find out how well we're doing, how well our investments are doing, how well our processes are working. And then that would, comes back to making better investments for you guys. So. Excellent, thank you, uh, Kim. I was gonna ask you on AI, I was on a long flight coming back from Greece the other day and I was reading an article. Mark Cuban said the world's first trillionaire will come from AI. We all know AI is the future. What are the biggest challenges you see in bringing AI to the masses the next couple of years? Uh, I think the biggest challenge I see, and Michael will know that I rant about this, the biggest challenge I see is misinformation. When somebody says AI, do they really mean AI? AI is 10,000 to 100,000 iterations before you even get a first draft. AI is the DARPA money that gets you the, the nice technology for the masses. Um, AI means that you have a black box, that you have chaos factors. Machine learning is amazing, it's wonderful. That's smart tutors, that's smart textbooks. So to me, the biggest challenge in bringing AI to the masses, there's two, one is misinformation and two, is lack of privacy. If you want to bring AI to the masses, you are going to lose all of your privacy because you cannot ask a program to calculate the best outcome if it does not have the information. So there's some choices that are going to have to be made about what kind of AI we use or institute. We use AI in different parts of the world right now on power grids and wonderful things like that. There's no laws of privacy there, those are really, really good things. So if we keep it to those kind of, of things that can do a lot of good, and if we wanna bring it into our private world, then we're gonna to have to give up some things. Excellent, please give Kim Schofield a big hand. <laughs> Excellent job, does anybody for a couple minutes, anybody have any questions for any of the panelists on any of the different topics? I'll come, I'll come down here and give you a mic. Uh, this question is for Kim Schofield. The uh, change in the opportunity funds that is affected by the capital gains, what do you see happening in that zone and how do startups access and maximize their opportunity there? Um, that's a good question. I see, honestly, the world is changing quickly the world is getting smaller quickly, and I think the way to maximize for startups, and by definition of startups, everybody has their own definition. Um, I do growth companies, which means 
You've got 500,000 to a million in revenue. That's usually what I do, but we have a startup section as well. If you want to maximize your opportunity, first pick a mentor, pick a, an organization, pick something that you really love and trust. You have to really get to know these guys. This is a relationship that you will have for five to seven years, and these are decisions that everybody will be making for you, with you, or against you if, if you didn't find people that you understand and get along with. So the best way to take the opportunity funds, all your taxes, all, your, all the good things, all the bad things, Find an organization that you trust. Find a transparent organization that will show you all kinds of options because we will tell you blatantly that we are the last option. Private investment is what you come to after banks. Um, we're a really good option for what you want to do if a bank won't fund you. So maximize that. Find a good organization. Find one you trust. Find one that networks with everybody and really educate yourself. There are funds out there, investment funds. There are methods, protocols, um, structures for every kind of company going. And there is smart money for everybody. And just keep going until you find it. And I can give you some good organizations to start with, if that helps. There's some really good resource organizations that won't tell you what to do, but they will tell you where to look. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else uh, have any questions for the panelists? Going once, going twice. We got a question in the back here. Excellent. My name is Chandra Lingiseri. I'm one of the physicians from uh, here, Arkansas, Little Rock. Um, question to panelists. Number one, I love the WAG, the app. How do you relate that to patient engagement applications? Because people talk a lot about, more dearly about their pet animals than their own blood pressure or something else. What's your, um, what's your thoughts on that? And the AI is, thank you for eye-opening uh, insight into AI and how, what exactly is AI. Um, I really see that as a problem with the big corporations, hospitals, opening their data to startups and opening data to people who are bringing applications. And if they don't share it, like you said, you cannot generate solution. That's fascinating insight. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for, thank you. No problem. Go ahead, David. Uh, so I can uh, help you with the health side of your, your, your WAG, if I could, give some yeah. suggestions. Yeah. So my thought for, for you is that, to tie it back to medical, right? I mean, pets are family. I don't call, I don't own my, my poodle, they're my family. So I treat the, my, my poodle as that I would my family, meaning that I don't really care about the medical cost. They gotta go surgery, I'll pay it. Insurance doesn't cover too much. I do have a, a wellness plan, like a lot of people right now preventative medicine. Um, what I could suggest for you is tie it into health monitoring for, for the pet, right? So as exercising, they can monitor their health, blood pressure, whatever else they can and that you can have agreements with the different major vet firms and send it over for their records, okay? Uh, what I look at is all in one, right? You're providing the, the medical records, but that's been done already. For example, Banfield has that app for your medical records, right? What that's good for is that when you go to an emergency vet, they don't know, just like when I go to my emergency doctor, I have to go to my history, my drugs, my meds, everything else. By the time my dog is dying, I don't have time. Uh, so maybe your, your app for that could be just for the independence, maybe. But I know the bigger chains already have that in place. I'm just giving you some word of advice. I, I tried that five years ago. Oh, it's too late to the market. But maybe make it like a Fitbit kind of thing so that it monitors it and stores it for the, not only for the owner, but also for the, the vet of record, right? Because again, um, just like for my wife who had heart surgery, they're monitoring her heart right now, right? And they send over to see the heartbeat. You could probably do that. Because uh, we're talking about medical in general, uh, pets are our family, so we're giving the best medical we can. I mean, my, my poodle went for MRI, it cost me $2,000. But I didn't really care because it's my dog. I mean, I have my, my family. Um, so I'm just seeing something like, like that for you in, in your business to expand. Because if you have all in one, but, and you already have the consumer base, right? You have the, the walkers. My suggestion, we can talk offline is, Give them all in one shop. Whatever they want, they come to you guys. They already trust you, right? The main thing, you have consumer trust. So whatever else service you bring in, just add it on you know, incrementally. And you could probably get yours to be 
huge. I mean, uh, that, that's my take on it. Yeah, no, it's great feedback. Um, that's one thing that we definitely want to explore is uh, having pet medical records within our app, you know, working closely with, um, you know, other, having JVs with, with these types of um, partner, these vets like Banfield, et cetera. But one thing that we've seen in the pet world recently is that the health of, of pets is something that's top of mind to all pet owners. There's a lot of like startups in the space now that essentially make organic pet food um, that are completely blowing up. People are spending a ton of money on organic pet food, like uh, sort of like Blue Apron for your pet, if you will. Um, we've seen a lot of that. And with WAG specifically, every time we enter your house, we know what medicine your dog takes. We know what toys your dog plays with. We know what leashes your dog uses. So we have all that data. And one thing that we're super excited about is, you know, down the road as we scale, really, um, you know, providing, you know, medication, um, you know, maybe, you know, serving uh, ads to customers, having joint ventures, like I mentioned, um, to really give that experience to the pet parent so they know that we are, like I said earlier, we are the button on your phone for your pet. Um, so, yeah, super exciting space. Um, and I definitely see it in the, in the health world is that, people like what you mentioned is that like it's your baby it's like it's a part of the family like you know if something happens to the dog the whole family is like completely you know screwed up I, you know i think we all can relate to that for sure so um yeah thanks for the feedback thank you guys for participating and asking good questions please give david rucci brendan spencer and kim a big hand Healthcare for our pets, amazing. 